Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll now start our panel on leading the digital asset revolution, a Swiss spotlight. I'll hand things over to our moderator, Katrina, to get us started. Thank you very much, Sophia. Um, a warm welcome from my side to this Swiss panel. Obviously, we'd all have very much enjoyed to have you in Davos uh, here in Switzerland. You will see that at least one of our panelists has managed to at least convey some uh, mountain feeling. I hope you enjoy it. I have a very distinguished panel, which I'd like to introduce to you briefly. We have uh, David Nunes, the CEO of Six Digital Exchange. Six Digital Exchange is the equivalent of uh, Six Swiss Exchange, the traditional Swiss stock exchange, but focusing on digital assets and the trading and settlement of digital assets. It received the approval of the Swiss Financial Market Authority to go live in September 2021. So a big step in the Swiss uh, digital asset infrastructure. We further have Florian Weiss, uh, CEO of Kryptonite Asset Management, a Geneva-based um, asset manager, which offers uh, qualified and institutional investors access to cryptocurrency investments. We'll be hearing more about why they're needed in the Swiss marketplace later on. Then we have uh, Tanvi Singh. She's a managing director of Credit Suisse and is responsible for the digital transformation of Credit Suisse. She has built one of the leading uh, largest analytic and data science teams in the space of banking, financial, regulatory, compliance, and risk in Switzerland. We further have Dr. Thomas Pushman. He's director of the Swiss FinTech Innovation Lab of the University of Zurich. So coming also or bridging the gap between um, innovation on the one hand and theory on the other hand. And we have Matthias Imbach, the co-founder and group CEO of Signum Bank, which was the first uh, bank to receive the banking license. It is a digital asset focused bank and got its license back in August 2019. So with that, I'd like to kick off and maybe first ask David Nune um, how it was to go live as a digital asset exchange. And I understand that during the approval phase and in the recent weeks, you've um, been testing the integration of the digital asset system of the blockchain into existing payment systems. I'd be interested to know more about these pilot um, test phases and what they actually mean and the importance of that for the integration of digital assets into the banking system. Well, thank you very much indeed, Katrina. I'd be very happy to talk about those. So your, I suppose the question has an answer that's in three parts. So the first part is our actual go live as a regulated financial market infrastructure, but providing a, a CSD, that's essential securities depository, on a distributed ledger, uh, which was that which we received a license to operate um, back in September of this of last year. So uh, how was it to go live? Um, it was a, a, a very substantial uh, collaborative effort between ourselves and our member banks who were very grateful uh, for their support. Uh, so that was UBS and Credit Suisse and Zurich Cantonal Bank. I think that really emphasizes the fact that uh, within this space, everything is collaborative. So you can't move the infrastructure forwards without everyone being on board and being part, uh, sort of being on the train with you. Uh, so, very, so very, very grateful, but also um, it, it was simply, you know, it would not be possible if there hadn't been for their efforts to ensure that they could integrate to the new technology so they could consume the, uh, the, the revolutionary settlement process, the instantaneous uh, atomic swap. So trading and settlement being one, sig one single step. So uh, I think that was very substantial. Then the other projects that you alluded to, the experiments we've been carrying out in the wholesale central digital bank currency space. Uh, so the um, so our W um, uh, CBDC activities have been threefold really. There's been uh, Helvetia uh, phase one and two and Helvetia phase two just finished um, and, and Project Euro. So Helvetia was a project to demonstrate that, um, that a wholesale CBDC could be integrated with existing core banking systems and the processes of commercial and central banks. So that also showed that issuing a CBDC on a distributed ledger 
um, uh, owned and operated by uh, by a Swiss a company under Swiss law was uh, was feasible, and that was SDX, um, and also uh, that the um, that the uh, inter, that the monetary policy and uh, as well as the uh, as well as the actual uh, infrastructure at the at the central bank side could actually consume um, the, uh, the the subsequent settlement process, and then Project Euro, uh, which, which was completed earlier last year, was actually uh, that was um, a cross-border uh, CBDC experiment with the Bank of France. So that showed that we could do direct transfer of euro and Swiss franc wholesale CBDCs between um, French and Swiss commercial banks on a single uh, DLT platform, which in this case was SDX. But I think that all these just go to show that we're having to work very hard in the institutional space to explore um, what, the what the possibilities of the technology are, but also what's required as, as from a participant perspective in terms of integrating to the technologies and building up capacity, both knowledge and, and, and infrastructure on their side to actually take advantage of, of that technology. Because it really is the sort of the building the financial markets infrastructure of the future, and that's a that's a group effort if ever there was one. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. Tanvi, Credit Suisse was mentioned. I'd I'd like to understand what your role was in this process, and then also we can maybe go into the first bond issuance, which took place on the on the SDX, and what that actually means for the digital asset market and for the financial market infrastructure. Thank you, Katrina. I will add on to a lot that David had already said about this topic, but um, we were very proud to have acted as a joint lead manager in a very historic transaction, the issuance of the world's first digital bond in a fully regulated environment. I think regulations play a key role and we have been listening since morning also on the GBBC panels of the role that it plays for the institutional investors and in institutions like us to play a role in this market. So November 18th was the D-Day and uh, was we were an issuing agent, launched the first digital bond on the XTS platform. The digital bond was issued in a parallel tranche to the traditional bond by a syndicate of banks, as uh, Thomas just mentioned, UBS and Circle Cantonal Bank. The issue was a success with demand for the digital tranche much higher than expected. So we also see the ecosystem and the clients uh, being excited of experimenting and having the first digital bond coming in. Um, we opened up the secondary market trading on the 29th of November, which was the second step in the process. Um, this was three years of work for XTX, and we see them uh, having been instrumental in that space um, and months and months of prep for Credit Suisse. Um, and the effort was across multiple different teams in the investment bank and in the transformation space. So no one person has made this instrumental, uh, I agree. And I would believe that would also have happened on the partner bank side. I think the project had given us an excellent opportunity to better understand how to integrate digital assets and the associated process changes into the system because our system are still um, developed for the mainstream traditional um, infrastructural setup. So determination of risk weighting for holding digital bonds, uh, the tokenized um, uh, Swiss franc, managing the credit risk, uh, uh, representing the tokenized uh, CHF on the front and back front office systems and flows uh, has been a big learning curve. So I believe that has given us a fair amount of understanding of how much effort is needed when we get uh, uh, more, more of our work mainstream into the digital asset space. And we're mm -hmm. also proud to have partnered with SDX, with the BIS Innovation Hub and many other names that Thomas, uh, that, uh, that David just talked about, also in uh, Project Helvetia, as well as Project Jura. I think it's just very closely related to the work we did on the bond issuance that also gives us a step forward to be part of these big experiments. And hopefully 2022 would see a lot of these things coming mainstream. So it was a very important step to bring us in that space and the other uh, Swiss banks. Um, and we are very proud to what we have achieved in uh, the November of last year. Sounds, sounds great. Matthias, this all happened in November and Signum as a bank had an excellent 2021 already before uh, SDX went live with uh, incredible growth rates um, and helping roughly 1,000 institutional clients to navigate the crypto market. Where is the interest coming from and what spurs in your mind the, this market? 
Yeah, it was indeed. 2021 was, uh, I think, for, for not just for Signum, but for the general digital asset industry, the focus on um, uh, cryptocurrencies, but increasingly also secure tokenized uh, securities, um, uh, a very significant year. It was uh, really a, a massive step on the basis of now further built out infrastructure, regulatory clarity, but also scrutiny. And, and, and just the general market, macro environment, everything coming together was just a perfect breathing ground for this asset class to, to do another big step towards mainstream adoption. And for Signum, this has, has meant to, um, to has, has also particularly te been tailored towards the, 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 the client segments that we are focusing on, which is institutional investors, qualified private investors, and also by our B2B offering banks. So typical client um, uh, you can think of uh, for for Signum would be uh, large crypto um, foundations, founders of crypto projects, of DeFi pro projects, but also family offices, asset managers that are starting to allocate part of their assets into the space that need to have uh, a baseline infrastructure for custody for the fiat digital asset gateway, mm -hmm. and then depending on the on the um, on on the client segment, add-on services, be it asset management services, be it Lombard loan, so we take crypto as collateral or or um, or, uh, or tokenization services. What maybe is noteworthy is that a significant pickup in the interest by by banks. So we have an increasing number of banks, um, also very old, uh, you know, two hundred year old mm -hmm. private banks that are starting to offer these services to to their clients via our offering. And so that was a big change last year, which is obviously an indirect amplifier because you have banks with thousands of clients onboarded over many years in a compliant fashion that now have access to the to the market so um so that's kind of to give you some flavor of where the growth mm -hmm. is has come from and it actually the, this year has again started uh, equally with even uh, increased growth rate so uh, it continues uh, Florian, that brings me directly to my question why do institutional investors need support in providing asset management services to their clients. What is it which hinders them to go directly to the market? As uh, Matthias said, banks are going to other banks to get these services. Is it the intransparency of the existing crypto markets which prevents them from tackling asset management themselves? Or do they need other um, services? Well, I think it's obviously a bit of a mixture of everything. But the, the, the reality, in my opinion, comes from uh, back in 20 years when the dot-com came, um, the banks were faced with a change in paradigm. In, in clients wanted to invest in this asset class. They needed to have different standards. They had new wealth coming from different sources. But the banks or the asset managers were more comfortable in having this tech wave number one, let's put it this way, because all the research the infrastructure was similar to the one they had before. The, the where, uh, just, uh, they were having um, the same Florian, we have a problem with your um, voice. Not quite sure you broke up, but now we didn't hear you. Okay. I hope it now is better fine. now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what I was saying is, uh, you know, back in the years when you had the first tech revolution, let's put it this way, in asset management, uh, all the research, all the, the information were coming from investment banks. So it was in the comfort zone of banks and asset managers. They didn't have to, to very much look, I don't want to say look far, but they had everything bringing to them. When I realized, when I first met, entered into cryptocurrencies four years ago, it was my wealth manager background as a, as a you know, I was with a very uh, a traditional bank before. And what came odd is everything would change. The sources of information would not be in from the traditional channels. The custody would not be the same. The exchange were not the same. The type of clients would not be people that have grown up in banks. They would be probably entrepreneurs. Look at this, uh, this asset class. 
cryptocurrency for the first time in history almost has been uh, born from the retail uh, uh, market it has not been raised it has not it has not, hasn't come from the institutional market and this is very disturbing for asset managers because what do you rely on how do you how do you address this which what are the stanzas you want to put in asset management and in parallel to this, you have pressure from your clients. Clients see this in every newspaper, in the streets, with friends. They all see that cryptocurrencies is something that you want to address. So Kryptonite was really made because we thought we need to be the gateway. And we understand, and David said this very initially, it is a collaborative entrepreneurship. There is no onboarding of everything. We need to collaborate. We need to grow through partnerships. We have recently uh, made a partnership with Wave Financial from uh, Los Angeles, which is one of the largest wealth manager uh, in, in, in the US, actively wealth managing crypto assets. And the reason for this is because we need to bring together resources in order to give an answer to bank and asset managers how to best advise your clients. And you can't build everything in-house. You need to partner. Uh, Matthias and Signum we was also some uh, you know a bank that we are onboarding with in order to have custody in Switzerland for our products for our clients. This is the only way to, to do so. So I'm in order to precisely say what is refraining asset management or institutions to enter into the cryptocurrencies. I think this is we need to uh, go hand in hand and educate and try to have appropriate solutions to every category of clients. This is very important. There is no one pot fits all. You need to have everything. Uh, Matthias mentioned 200 year old bank. Absolutely, we are in this business and we approach them very differently. And only by having proposal, advisory and proper product, you can actually answer the needs of a very broad client base. Tanvi, one of the aspects which Florian highlighted was that these products, they do not fit in the, let's say, traditional um, investment banking sphere. They have other risks. They've got technology layers. They need additional um, knowledge. I, I know that you've been looking at the risk and compliance aspect of trading in digital assets as a bank. What is there to add to what uh, Florian said? I think Florian said it very well, so did David, about the ecosystem and the speed with which the digital asset industry, the, the crypto industry moves. It's very difficult for a traditional bank or any of the traditional setup to catch on to, uh, given the timelines and speed. I mean, we were talking DeFi, we we're talking DeFi 2.0, perhaps in 2022, we we're talking DeFi 3.0. Um, regulatory scene is also uh, something which is in the making, and we hear that 2022 would be the year where we get to have more regulatory understanding. I think Switzerland is uh, more privileged in that aspect. We have a lot of those regulations, a lot more clearer than other jurisdictions like America. So. Um, from, from, my, from my perspective, it would be more an ecosystem play. We at CS are part of the Open Wealth organization, which absolutely makes sure that all the players, which are the clients, the asset managers, the big banks, and the fintechs in the space can collaborate and work together. So especially um, the newer um, breed of technology, both globally as well as locally, um, who are part of the Open Wealth uh, setup, and more and more of the collaboration is would be the would be the game in my opinion for more traditional players like ourselves rather than building in technology and building in processes all within our own infrastructure so some of the compliance solutions as uh, TRM Labs, Alliance Block have been working on, some of the data security um, aspects of some of the new fintechs um, that, are, that are working in that space definitely would be in, in, that, in the space of open APIs that we can collaborate and work with. So I feel that especially around compliance and regulatory, since this is an absolutely different asset class and um, more driven by the retail and less driven by the investment bank and by, uh, by, by the researchers, it's very difficult to predict uh, the volatility is definitely a case, but as uh, the big institutions are going to uh, play a game in here, especially around compliance, regulatory, uh, taxing, it would be a collaborative effort with some of the um, some of the newer startups that are trying to play a game in that space, um, and not all of the technology and processes developed within within the big institutions. Mm. Okay, interesting, Thomas. 
we are we are here in a distinguished group of financial institutional players. Um, at the same time, we see a lot of activity, obviously, also in the decentralized finance areas with smart contract driven liquidity pools, lending and staking offerings from from a more theoretical point of view. How do you view these two different developments which are happening, in my view, partly side by side, you know, um, and where do you see these two streams going in the future? Will they converge? Will, will they stand as two separate offerings next to each other? Thank you, Katrina, for this question. Yeah, that's that's one of the core questions. What we can observe at, at the moment is that DeFi really evolves as a separate financial system, um, uh, com complementing the, the existing um, So I think this is especially also due to the fact that uh, the incumbents were, as also Tani put it, rather hesitant or were not so far in the beginning of the uh, entrepreneurs was really fast and uh, they are mo mo moving faster than the in, in, in incumbents did. So will there be two separate worlds uh, or two separate entities or will they converge at, at some point in time? But what we can do it's always hard to predict what will happen, but you can build on scenarios. So uh, what we can see at the moment is that bridges are built from, from both sides. So um, some examples are the crypto offerings that the incumbent players uh, uh, have, have to or, or provide um, for their for their clients because the clients ask ask for it. Um, and the startups that offer these solutions also to the banks um, and the and 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 the financial in institutions and there are there are also the examples around with uh, project Helvetia and Eura and S S S S S T X which also show that uh, the incumbent players are also stepping up. So I would say uh, there there is a new world that is emerging. Um, uh, I wouldn't say that they will or that they remain disconnected. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say there will be new players also in that way that we will see in the in the future, and they will be integrated some somehow into a new in a new system that probably won't look the same as we have it today. So it sounds like a much more fragmented market than it was historically. Also, hearing Tanvi talk about the collaboration between startups and more established large institutions. Is that correct, Thomas? Yeah, I would, I would say so. Well, if you look back in, in, in history, what uh, financial intermediation looks like, um, especially if you look to the United States, then one can observe that uh, fragmentation uh, over the past 20 years was even uh, increasing. So it was not a consolidation process from that perspective. It was more the world that was established. And I think with this um, uh, a trend towards decentralization and DeFi more specifically, I think this trend will come, not continue there. So this, uh, it won't stop. Okay. And maybe a, maybe a, a Katrina, if I may just add to this, I, I agree with it. And But ultimately, what, what happens here is that it, the technology at its core allows for more choice, right? It uh, allows choice for, for people to either choose to directly custodize, self-custodize, to go uh, to invest their money into liquidity pools on decentralized financial platforms, or they may want to go through infrastructure providers, um, the, uh, regulated players, unregulated players, whatever you name it, and have different options. And so um, to in an open source, decentralized, community-driven environment, it will be extremely important also for regulated players to set themselves up from a technology standpoint in a way that it's modularized, that it's API-driven, that it's um, allowing that to happen, but then adding the element of trust, the curation, the figuring out which aspects or which of these pools do we want to provide access to to our clients, knowing what, the, uh, for example, a bank 
stands for and what what the the quality requirements are to protect customers as well. So I think that will be the role as it emerges. And we are right now in that process as also banks and regulated financial institutions to educate and work with the regulators on how do we link these two these two worlds. I'll give you an example at Signum just to make it tangible. We are working through topics such as if we as a bank invest in a DeFi pool, what does that mean from an accounting standpoint, from a rec capital requirement standpoint, from a lick ratio standpoint? What, what is it? Who is the counterparty? How do we organize uh, as per the FINMA outsourcing uh, circular, a, a decentralized liquidity pool where you need to have annual audit, audited financials? You can't really do that, right? So we just have to adapt uh, to this new world. And, and mm -hmm. I think Switzerland is beautifully positioned to, to act fast here and faster than others. And if I, I could add to what Matthias was saying as well, sorry, Thomas. <laughs> sorry, that, uh, as rebounding on, on what Matthias uh, uh, was saying, because I think it's it's really uh, uh, amazing how we can see from you know within a year, not not more than that, we saw bankers, asset managers, you know, as wealth managers moving from a standpoint of completely ignoring this field, this asset class, then suddenly by pressure of their clients coming and asking for simple questions, general questions, uh, as it says. The, the speed the the, at, at what it, it, it is now increasing, exactly as, as was said, now you're facing a situation where you cannot not give an advice because if you are not advising your client, he will find the first thing that is being advised to him and most likely is going to be an Ill, uh, something that he should not be doing. And it will go back to the family office, the asset managers or the, or the, or the bank itself. Because we all know one thing is the client when he's not happy, he comes back to his bank or to his banker, his asset manager and say, you didn't, you didn't talk me out of it. So there is a an urgency, but of course we need to do this with due process, but there is an urgency to actually be able to give well-educated advice to those clients who absolutely, absolutely wants to uh, invest in it. And there is so many connections to be made in different things that we can't just be sitting on the fans. David. Yeah, I, yes, I, I was going to mention, so the the sort of fragmentation that Thomas is alluding to, and I think Matthias's point was, was very accurate on this front, that will be um, that will be resolved, or at least it'll be moved forwards by getting regulatory clarity. And that's another area that that, that we've been working as STX very you know, hand sort of hand in glove with with FIMA uh, on the one hand and the SMB on the other to ensure that we understand what their what their concerns are when it comes to this technology and the and the asset classes that we're talking about here. Because ultimately, regulation in this instance is there. For investor protection, and that's not a that, that's not a uh, simply an awkward imposition that we're that, that we're putting onto this sort of these innovative uh, technology companies and financial services companies. It's a very real thing, um, but we have to understand as providers in this space what are the risks uh, as we see them or as as our regulator sees them, and how do we address those concerns and actually show that te technology can actually address all these issues. Uh, if it doesn't today, then what needs to be added to that technology to enable it to address it tomorrow? But it's very much, again, a collaborative effort. And we've been very grateful to, um, to FIMA as be, when it comes to being a, a very constructive partner in this dialogue, because it's, I think it's something that, again, sets Switzerland apart in having that, um, that approach that, that FIMA does towards this particular space, because it's been deeply helpful, as I think has um, the position of the SMB when it comes to their support for the, uh, obviously, for Helvetia and for Euro and the BIS Innovation Hub. There's all these different parties that are all you know, trying really hard to ensure that we, that we can take advantage of the technology and the opportunities that it represents, um, but at the same time do that in a way which, which, we doesn't, which doesn't open up investors to significant additional risks that can't be addressed. So maybe as you've just come out of the FINMA approval process, for those people listening to us and thinking of or considering to come to Switzerland with their project, what is your advice on how to work together with FINMA? Well, I think that the, uh, that the, the sort of the traditional crypto native approach of see what I can get away with and apologize later um, mm -hmm. is probably not the right approach and certainly not one that Six Group and SDX would, uh, would be endorsing. So we're, we're very much coming from the opposite direction. So we were, we're Six Group already a regulated 
financial markets infrastructure provider, so heavily regulated uh, with a very close relationship with FINLA. So our approach was always understand what their concerns are and address those concerns with the technology. But it's all as a result of, again, SDX can be perceived from a regulatory perspective as being an experiment. Let's see what, what it means to get an FMI uh, regulated using uh, when, it actually result, when it's depending on blockchain technology. So that educates the regulator um, and gets them to understand what you know, what, how that technology can actually um, attend to their concerns and also what opportunities it represents because we believe that, it, that what, we have in, what we've actually implemented reduces risk in the financial system as a result of compressing the settlement cycle and removing additional parties involved in that chain and reducing costs that ultimately will, um, will benefit the underlying investor. So those are the benefits that we've articulated to the regulator and they are absolutely, um, no, they completely buy into that. I think they're, you know, they're, they fully understand what this, what this promises in terms of just the DLT side of things, let alone additional sort of aspects of the digital asset universe like programmable assets and, um, and, and ultimately um, functionality available in crypto. But, um, but it's, it's been very much, a, again, a collaborative experience. So my advice would be, um, well, if you want to do it right, then, then you do it from the perspective of a, of a collaborative relationship with FINMA and ensure that they understand what it is that you're trying to actually provide to, your, to, 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 the, to the customer base within, within Switzerland and work with them to ensure that, they've, that you address their concerns. Mm -hmm. But I think it's fair to say you also have to give your project enough time for this collaboration. Indeed, and I think that that's something else that you know, we're I'm under no illusions that technology is not um, is uh, it is you know, it's relatively immature, and it's and we're you know we're building this as we go along as well, which also gives you an opportunity as well to make sure that you're guiding the development of the technology along the lines that uh, that address those concerns mm -hmm. that the FIMRA is highlighting. I'd like to use the last few minutes of our webinar to look ahead rather than look at the status quo and where we are. Thomas, what kind of trends do you see for 2022 and beyond in this field? Well, I think um, we have some trends that are clearly uh, uh, going down, down, down the road. So the, the first one is that DeFi will become more mature. Uh, uh, David has said that it is not that mature yet and we don't see really where this will all go through. Um, I think we will see many um, uh, new in instruments and products and uh, business models emerging um, over, over time. Uh, we very, very often uh, overestimate the time until that will happen. So think that this will be next, next, next year. Or so I think it will be more years to come um, because the te 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 technology is not, is not there. Um, I think the, the second clear trend that we will see um, is also a more clear perspective on the reg regulatory side. Um, as we mm -hmm. talked about this, um, I think maybe a term that may, might describe that is that of hyper-specialization. So very small services that can be combined and uh, work to go together in kind of a net, net network. Of course, you might then uh, ask uh, what impact this has on the reg regulation side. And I think uh, it requires a very different approach because then you cannot um, regulate financial institutions anymore, but you need to cover that from, from an act activity perspective um, and see, is this really the same thing as, as, the, as the other th thing? And the third one, I think, is more on, uh, and that is my uh, favorite at the, at the moment, is more on combining uh, fintech and sustainability. I think uh, uh, fintech can be a, a catalyst for sustainability. We have that in the, in the crypto asset market as well. Uh, and there is this question of uh, how can we decrease uh, the carbon footprint of Bitcoin and other proof of work uh, uh, carbon assets. Uh, or, or digital assets. So this is one of the core questions there. Uh, but it is also um, um, other questions that, that are around here with uh, value chains and supply chains um, that uh, can be uh, de decarbonized by, by fintech. And I think these are the, the three trends that we can see uh, for the forthcoming years. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Matthias, 
how do you see the new ledger-based security laws in Switzerland evolve? Will we see Novartis shares be digitized or will we rather see SMEs using that, that to tokenize their shares and then maybe later on go on to SDAX with their shares? How do you, how do you see that evolving? Yeah, first I would mention that it's uh, a great uh, it's great to see that Switzerland, and not just on the financial regulatory side, but also on the legal side, has has uh, been able to to shape this in a way that we have really full legal clarity and can can tokenize assets um, and, and 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 build business models around it. Um, and in terms of what comes first, I think neither of what, what you've mentioned. I, I'm pretty convinced that it won't be the currently NASDAQ listed or SME listed uh, companies that will tokenize their shares. Things are working fine. Um, you know, you can, you can trade them easily. The infrastructure is up and running and extremely efficient. Um, I'm not saying, though, that it will never happen. There will be that point at some point where it changes. But I think this is a few years out. I think it will be those assets where uh, you people see the most tangible benefit of being able to do things that you could not do before. For example, um, things like um, the DLT law can be used to tokenize real assets, to fractionalize real, ass real assets, even NFTs, where you can make a one token, a unique asset, a non-fungible token, fungible, making it a security. And that's also what we've been focusing on by tokenizing art, wine, NFTs, crypto punks, etc., and we feel this is the first wave. And uh, in addition to that, uh, of course, there will be more and more SMEs uh, that are leveraging in the, the, the private in the private markets the ability to um, organize cap tables more efficiently and manage investors more efficiently. But um, you know, generally, I have stopped predicting when the real inflection points on asset tokenization comes because we've all all predicted it already five years ago. So um, I'm I'm convinced it will come, um, but I don't know when. So until then, let's just all invest and get ready for it, and then uh, and then the future will look, look bright. So that's my my take. My take. Perfect. I'd like to very briefly open the floor for any final comments which you'd like to make, which you have not been able to make so far. Well, you, you were you were asking just one thing about you know where how we see the futures in terms of investment management and asset management. I might you know put just one comment. I think that if there is one thing that will guide us of what will happen or come our way is to look at the hedge fund industry. I mean, the hedge fund industry has shown very clearly for decades that it has been very overly creative sometimes, but it is a field where suddenly a lot of different minds are getting together. The difference this time. You have, because of the open source, because of the accessibility of everything, you don't need to be a Goldman Sachs graduate or a, a, from a very famous institute, you know, uh, uh, investment bank to become a very good or a very uh, a talented manager. The, the competition, but I would say the opportunity is ahead where many people that would not necessarily have the chance to show their skills have now the possibility of doing this. That's why also at Kryptonite, we have a very, we, we incubate, if we can say that, traders and investment management strategy, because we would like to give the chance of people with a good investment strategy to build on it. And that's why I think this is where we have to go. We have to open up the door to create more product, better product, risk management product, in order to be able to satisfy, as David was saying, the risk of the regulator that, that is pointing, uh, FINMA is clear, is clear on the risk they want to take. And we need to be sure that we structure products that satisfy this level of risk and manage it the way that it's not going everywhere and it becomes uncontrollable. But Switzerland uh, you know, has, has a very big chance on capitalizing for this and really taking the lead on investment management for crypto assets in the future. I genuinely believe that. I think that's I think a also, brilliant point for Switzerland. Yeah, but Tanvi. I think one of the topics that we haven't touched it in a big way in our conversation today is education. 
and literacy mm -hmm. on this new asset class, um, whether it's the people who are building this infrastructure, uh, which is a graduate from the university that Thomas can talk about, or whether it's in general, the usage of decentralized finance of some of the digital assets, it comes in with its own set of inherent risks. But if people are aware of it and they understand what the risks are and what the usages are, because the front end is not so well developed for people to be using this as they have been using the traditional banking mm -hmm. services, it would go a long way for people making the right choices of where they're investing their risks in. So perhaps one of the areas I feel in 2022 and onwards uh, would be important is just education across the board, whether it's around development uh, or whether it's about usage of some mm -hmm. of these new technologies. Very good point. I think we've just hit our timeline. I would like to thank all of the participants for this interesting discussion. Hope to stay in touch and I hope we, it was of interest to the people who have listened to us. Thank you for your presence. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Back to Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye.